My name is Red Schiller. I'm vice chair of the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health at Mount Sinai and um, senior vice president at the Institute. Um, I want to welcome everybody, people who are currently in the room, people who are at 16th Street and people, people upstate. Um, we're delighted to have Dr. Alan Fleischman today. Um, he is a nationally renowned uh, bioethicist and, and uh, pediatrician, um, and, um, and also a dear friend of Dr. Goldie Alfasi, who uh, helped broker this appearance. Um, just a few comments about ethics, and then I'll, we'll, we'll start. I, I, uh, I've been involved in the Ethics Committee at, uh, at Beth Israel for a number of years, and, and um, one of the things that uh, we've been trying to do is bring the experience of ethical consults and ethical dilemmas um, really into the curriculum. Um, Dr. Fleischman's done that, and he may have a chance to talk a little bit about that, um, how he's done that at, at, um, at Einstein. Um, but more and more, when you think about the shift of care from inpatient to outpatient facilities, um, there's a catch-up, I think, that needs to happen around bioethical issues. There's some bioethical dilemmas that we're facing to some extent around access, financing, prior authorization of medications, a variety of things that we're faced with that really present some ethical dilemmas. And, you know, today I hope we have a framework in which we can proceed forward with both dealing with that on the clinical level as well as um, the educational level. So Dr. Fleischman is a professor of clinical pediatrics and um, professor of clinical epidemiology and population health um, at the, in the Bioethics Center at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. He joined the faculty at Einstein and Montefiore in 1975, where he served as director of the Division of Neonatology in the Department of Pediatrics. In 1994, he became senior vice president of the New York Academy of Medicine, where he catalyzed the Academy's growth into a research-intensive think tank and public policy urban health and bioethics. In, in 2004, Dr. Fleischman became ethics advisor to the, um, to the children's, uh, I'm sorry, to the National Children's Study and the National Institutes of Health, and served as chair of the Federal Advisory Committee from 2005 to 2010. In 2007, Dr. Fleischman became the vice president and medical director of the March of Dimes Foundation, where he developed multiple clinical research initiatives to prevent preterm birth, infant mortality, birth defects. He ended his tenure in 2012 and returned to teaching at Einstein and Montefiore. Dr. Fleischman is a pioneer in the field of bioethics and research ethics. This work has resulted in over 160 publications in peer-reviewed journals and book chapters. And um, we're excited to hear about a, a book that he's been published with uh, colleague Robert Cassidy entitled Pediatric Ethics from Principles to Practice. It's going to come out next year. He's, Dr. Fleischman's also been a consultant to several federal agencies, including the NIH, EPA, FDA, CDC. He's been elected a fellow and a member of the board of directors of the Hastings Center and elected fellow of the New York Academy of Medicine. He's also founding member of the New York State Governor's Task Force on Life and the Awe and bio, the Bioethics Commission and served there for 27 years. As you can see, he's got all the credentials you need to be able to embark on this journey that uh, he'll share with us today. Alan, thanks for coming. Thank you very much. Um, it is a pleasure to be here at Mount Sinai. I've been in this room a few times. Um, I just want to pause for a moment because this is a very special day in our history here in New York. Um, it is September 11th. Uh, 14 years ago, those of us sitting at Mount Sinai and at the New York Academy of Medicine and every other health institution in New York felt the fear, felt the anger, felt the trauma that everyone else felt, but we also felt the responsibility, the responsibility for trying to prepare for what we thought were going to be thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of victims. Um, luckily, um, we didn't have hundreds of thousands of victims, but we learned that we weren't ready. And 14 years later, we're much more ready for those traumas. But for those of us who experienced it, I think we do have some continuing um, stress on a day of memorial, a day in which we think about the people we've lost and the problems um, that we have to face 
in the future. Uh, Sinai has been a major player in the recuperative health of many of the victims and their family members. Um, so I just want to pause for a moment remembering that day and uh, how the health community responded uh, in its best um, time. So now, thank you to Red and to Neil and to Goldie for having invited me. Um, and we'll work from here. Um, I have no conflicts of interest to reveal, and my opinions are my own. So I will have a few preliminary slides, and then I'd like to present a case, and then a second case. Um, and these cases come from the real life experiences that the residents here have shared with us, and that the residents at Montefiore, uh, who I work with, have had quite similar experiences. Well, what is medical ethics? As you think about that field, there's no one in the room who hasn't taken a course or a lecture or have been exposed to the study of moral conflict and conduct. Ethics really is the justification of behaviors in the face of hard choices and competing values. We have conflicts of values. You and I may disagree about what's in the best interests of a patient. Or even more importantly, you as my physician may disagree with what's in my best interests as your patient. And physicians also have conflicts of duties and conflicts of obligations. We have obligations to many others other than our patients, although our beneficence-based obligations to our patients are powerful. Our job is to maximize their benefit, minimize their risk. But what other obligations can you think of today that you have other than the obligations you will have when you go to the clinic or go to the floor and take care of your patients? You have obligations to yourself. You have obligations to your family and your close friends. You have obligations to the institution for which you work. And you have obligations to those who pay for the services that you render. The levels of those obligations are quite different. And you might think you have obligations to others. We have obligations to the public's health, the population health, as compared to the individual health. And you might come up with some different obligations. But we have those conflicts of obligations and duties that we as physicians need to recognize and to deal with. But truly difficult ethical choices are not between good and evil. Those are easy. Those were taught to us in our youth, our parents, our religious leaders, our friends taught us about good and evil. But between one good and another concept of the good are the true difficult ethical choices. And we'll come to some of those in those cases. Now, at least in the Bronx, and some of you do work in the Bronx, Clinicians are skeptical. They say, ah, oh, ethics. Ethics is just a matter of opinion. It's your ethics, it's my ethics, it's his ethics, it's her ethics. Um, it's got no rigor, it's got no import, it's not relevant. Well, actually, ethical analysis requires rigorous justification, just like cardiac analysis, or nephrologic analysis or dermatologic analysis, or whatever subspecialist you might ask to consult on your patient, you take what they suggest and you ask for the evidence, you ask for the justification, you ask for the rigor of their analysis as you should in an ethical analysis as well. Now, I found that clinicians have several serious dilemmas when thinking about ethics. One is, because we can, must we provide a given treatment, rather than should we provide a given treatment. This has become increasingly likely as the decades have gone on, as the technology of medicine and the ability to intervene in very major ways in the end of life trajectory comes forward um, in our thinking. So should is a very powerful word that we need to invoke when we consider 
that it may not be in the best interests of a patient to be provided with a treatment that could be provided. So what that basically comes down to is should medically similar patients be treated in different ways based on patient or surrogate values and preferences. And while we treat evidence-based medicine, while we teach it, while we use it, while we understand it, we have to also understand that our patients respond to the evidence in ways that may be different from how we think of that evidence. So many physicians have difficulty with treating medically similar patients differently. And we need to consider that. I know that I, when I recommend a treatment to a patient or a family, will often have um, a belief that that's in the best interests of, their patient, of their, that patient or that family's interests. Yet, knowing that, I remember that it's not my decision alone about what we decide is the future treatment for that patient. Physicians are moral agents. We're not just waiters and waitresses who present the menu and step back and say, okay, what do you want? Chicken's good, but so's the steak and the fish. It's up to you. We are moral agents. We're responsible for our actions, and we're responsible for each other's actions. As a group of physicians, as a group of clinicians, we're responsible for one another. We are not to look the other way if we think there's a physician who's impaired. We're not to look the other way if we think there's a nurse who's not providing the kind of care that we think is optimal for that patient. We're not to look the other way if we become impaired, if we are unable to provide the care that we know we should be providing. We are moral agents. We're responsible for the decisions we make. We're obligated to protect patients from harm and secure their best interests, and we may have conflicting duties and obligations. So I want to talk about a couple of cases, and in order to do that, I just want to remind you of two important principles that we tend to invoke in thinking about healthcare decision making. First is the principle of respect for autonomy. Autonomy is the right to decide. Everyone in this room is an adult. I believe you're probably all capacitated, or I haven't checked. Um, you're certainly not normal, because if you were normal, that would mean you were average, and if you're average, you probably wouldn't be here because they pick only good people to come to these programs. And doctors tend to be, I think so, that, uh, <laughs> they're laughing over here in the front, so stay calm. Um, we, as clinicians, are capacitated generally, but people who are our patients are presumed to be capacitated until we judge them not having the capacity to participate in decision making. Now, Dr. Schiller told you that I am a reformed neonatologist. Um, so my patients never had the capacity to tell me what their values were nor what they wished. Although every once in a while, one of those little guys would pull an endotracheal tube out and maybe he knew what he was doing. But in order to be an autonomous adult with the right to make those decisions for yourself, you require the capacity to understand the options and to make an informed, rational choice. Autonomy is a negative right. It's very important today. Autonomy is a negative right. That is, it has the, you have the right as an autonomous adult to stop any interventions on you. You don't have a right to demand of your doctor interventions that are not in your medical interest. Many patients feel they do, and more importantly, many doctors feel they must do what the patients ask. Autonomy is a negative right. It's the right to refuse. It's not the right to demand. Another important principle is respect for persons. In respect for persons, we have two parts. One is 
that those who have capacity should be treated as autonomous and respected when they refuse or don't wish to have a treatment that's recommended. But those with diminished autonomy need to be protected. Those with diminished autonomy deserve our help and respect and need guidance and protection. And that's where things get complicated. So let me talk about the first case. It's not too complicated, but it's in small print. So I'll read it out. Carlos Rodriguez is a 73-year-old man with a history of depression, diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disease, and worsening renal insufficiency. You're going to see four of those patients this afternoon, right? I mean, this is not an unusual 73-year-old patient in your practice. Over the past six months, Dr. Anderson, the primary care physician, and Dr. Sanchez, his consulting nephrologist, have recommended the initiation of hemodialysis. Renal function is worsening. Mr. R has repeatedly refused. Three months ago, Mr. R required hospitalization for fluid overload and electrolyte disturbances, which were able to be treated without dialysis. That's what triggered the continued recommendations for dialysis. Yesterday, Mr. R was brought to, brought to the emergency department by his son Juan with shortness of breath and altered sensorium. He was unable to answer questions and was not easily arousable. Juan insisted that the doctors treat his father aggressively and do whatever is needed to save his life. Mr. R has a living will. It's in the chart. He signed it a year ago, but he has no health care proxy document. The living will has standard language about not wishing to have resuscitation if his heart stops, not wishing to have mechanical ventilation, not wishing to have tube feeding if he develops a serious and irreversible illness. Mr. R is admitted to the hospital under the care of Dr. Anderson and Dr. Sanchez. What should be done for Mr. R and who should decide? Now, I want you to think about that, and if they would let me leave the podium, which they say I can't, I'd be out in the audience with a microphone. So for those of you in the distant lands who are listening to us, I'm going to go back to the microphone soon. Um, do we have a medical student in the room? I saw some walking in, they're usually in the back. Okay. All right, you see, you, you actually raised your little finger here. <laughs> so, so I'm in the way of the slide. So what do you think about this? Are there any ethical dilemmas in this particular case? Um, well, it seems like he doesn't have capacity is the first big thing. Um, he's he doesn't have capacity is the first big thing. You did very well. Um, <laughs> he doesn't have capacity is the first big thing. So what this wise medical student has just said is that start with the patient. Start with the patient. Because our first job is to figure out two things about this patient. One is, does he have the capacity to participate in these decisions as an autonomous member of the dyad? Second is, who is he? What are his values? What can we learn about him? in terms of the behaviors that he's had that would help us to define his values. And what can we learn about his history? Does he have a living will? Does he have a health care proxy which has assigned a specific agent to make decisions if he cannot? So our first question is, who is Mr. Rodriguez? Can we learn from him? And if we are his primary care physician, and we've known him over the course of time, we know a lot about Mr. Rodriguez. We know a lot about his values. And we know a lot about what he might have wished in this situation. So that starts us off. And I think that's a very important place to begin. Are there any other ethical dilemmas? Resident? Pharmacy student, we'll come back to you. Resident? Preventive medicine resident. So are there any other ethical dilemmas that you see here? 
Well, I guess my concern is the patient three months ago was hospitalized for this. So at that time, was he willing to have a one-time treatment, which he may or may not want at this time? So I would take that into consideration when making a decision going forward. So what do you think about that? Um, so it, sa it looks like reading from it that he repeatedly refused dialysis even three months ago. He was true without dialysis. My one question would be, you were talking about how well the doctors know this patient. Um, I understand that point of view, but at the same time, wouldn't somebody argue that the son knows the patient even more? So the son, Juan, is asking the doctors to do everything they can in order to save his father's life. So that's very powerful. Should we listen to him? It depends on how well um, Juan knows his father and if it's in line with his father's values. So it can't just be Juan's decision. It needs to be Juan thinking as his father, what would his father want? So maybe it involves more family members beyond Juan. Maybe it involves more family members beyond Juan. Is Juan Mr. Rodriguez's surrogate? Well, he's the person there. He's a close relative. So presumably he would be the surrogate, except if you know there's a wife at home or something like that who would take priority according to the law. So, so we don't know if Juan is his primary surrogate. We agree that as his son, he has some real understanding of his father, hopefully. Maybe better than we as his doctor. But we don't really know unless we ask about the family. And, you know, Juan may be the guy who drove the car. Um, or he may be someone who knows his father well, lives with him, and is very close to him. Any other ethical concerns? Outside of what we've already talked about. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we, because we don't have a clear identified a healthcare proxy, um, we have to identify who would be making the decisions on his behalf. Um, and I mean, I think that's the main. So we need to think about, from our perspective as clinicians, what's in Mr. Rodriguez's best interests. And we need then to figure out who's going to be that surrogate decision maker who we can share our recommendations with and get some clarity as to how to move forward. What if Juan is incapacitated? What if he drove the car, but he also is a drug addict? He's not really quite capable, but he still asserts his interests. So we've got lots of complicated, complex things to do about Mr. Rodriguez. It starts, though, with our understanding who he is, what he would have wished if we could ask him today, and then it wraps into our figuring out who should decide now that he cannot. Yes? Does his history of depression and whether or not it may or may not have been well managed complicate the issue for, from your perspective? So a very wise comment. We threw in that he had a history of depression. So having a history of depression always puts up a red flag as to is this a treated depression? Is this a man who would have um, been incapable of deciding about renal dialysis. So this is an important aspect of his life. Most of the time, depression doesn't result in patients refusing needed medical interventions, but it may. So we need to understand that. And in fact, if early on, before he lost capacity, as he clearly has now, we might have wanted a mental health professional to help us decide whether Mr. Rodriguez is making a judgment that's not being impaired by mental illness about the dialysis. So for all surrogate decision making, we start 
by making what's called substituted judgments. We as the surrogate, not as the doctor, but as the surrogate for a patient, when I was making decisions for my mother, my mother was a very strong woman. She had very strong views about everything, including her son. Um, but she and I disagreed about her best interests at the end of her life. Yet I made every decision she would have wanted. Because I had the obligation as her surrogate to make a substituted judgment, invoking her views and values in the decision-making process. If I didn't know what her views or values were, if I didn't have an idea about it, and if Juan didn't know what his father's views were, then the surrogate needs to make a best interest judgment. Best interest is a great term. It comes out of the law. It's been used by ethicists forever. Some people think it's useless because it's totally subjective. There's no objective measure of best interest. Well, let's not say no, but there's rarely an objective measure of best interest. Um, best interests are often subjective, determined by those people who are actually facing the decision. But it's patient-focused. It's patient-focused. So the nice part about best interests is it requires us to put the patient as the center of the conversation and the focus. Not the spouse, not the children, not other siblings, not other people, but the patient. It also forces us to put the patient as the focus of the interests and not the institution, and not the economics, and not the gender identity, and not other characteristics that are socially determined. It requires us to focus on the patient's best interest. And our job, of course, as clinicians, as physicians, is to enhance and preserve functioning of individuals as best we know how. Um, the possibility of prolonging life needs to be balanced against alleviating suffering. These are two aspects of our medical obligations, of the goals of medicine. One of the goals is to prolong life. Another is to alleviate suffering. And sometimes those come in direct conflict. In direct conflict. And we know that. That doesn't mean that we need to prioritize one over the other. We obviously need to do all we can to alleviate suffering, even when our goal is to prolong life. But sometimes those two do come in conflict. <clears throat> and then best interest often comes down to thinking about what reasonable people might wish. Now, I know there are a lot of reasonable people in this room. You can probably define the few that are not reasonable. Um, and that's, a, again, a subjective measure. But when most people in our society look toward one direction, and we could dream of somebody who might look toward another, it isn't our obligation to always prioritize that one in a thousand or one in a million person um, over the other 999 in decision making. It's not in our obligation to do that, especially when we have surrogates that can help us. So in the year 2010, after 17 years of debate in the legislature, Dr. Schiller told you that I was part of the New York State Task Force on Life and the Law. 17 years before 2010, we provided to the legislature a full written bill that was passed in 2010. You don't want to look at sausage making and you don't want to look at legislation. Both are nasty um, and getting worse. But in 2010, we finally got the Family Health Care Decisions Act. So we actually have some law in New York that provides an ethical framework which is reasonable for making decisions when patients lose the capacity to choose. So surrogates are asked to make those decisions. 
The standard starts with substituted judgment. They are asked to take into account the values of the patient, the prior wishes of the patient, the written documents like living wills of the patient. But surrogates may make health care decisions for patients who lack decision-making capacity and have no health care agent or other legal guardian. That, if you come from another state, you say, uh-huh. Uh, but in New York, that was a big deal. Okay, so now it's been clearly codified in the law. They also may review all relevant personal health information. Sometimes there's sensitive information they don't need that you may want to keep from them. But in general, they're allowed to see all information that's relevant to making the decision. Some may be sensitive. The first question is capacity the ability to understand and appreciate the nature and consequences of proposed health care. So you must determine if the patient is capacitated. You assume it for most patients, but in those that you have question, you need to do a formal capacity assessment. Each institution tends to have its own approach. Most people believe that clinicians can make assessment judgments about capacity. Some institutions ask that you have a psych consultation in order to help you with that capacity assessment. But remember that capacity is decision specific. So some patients may have the capacity to say, yes, I would like to appoint my sister or my son or my wife as my agent to make decisions for me. That level of capacity may be much lower than the need to make hard decisions like, do I want to go on dialysis? And more importantly, the patient may say, I don't want my wife to be my surrogate, or I don't want my whoever to be my surrogate. And that also needs to be taken seriously if the patient has sufficient capacity to make that judgment. So capacity is decision specific, and it waxes and wanes. We know particularly in the elderly, um, some are quite good in the morning, others are quite good in the afternoon, um, few are good after two scotches, but it's um, important to know that it waxes and wanes, and that we may want to take the opportunity to talk to patients when we know they're strongest in their abilities. So who are those surrogates? There's actually a specific list of prioritization, and spouse or domestic partner and there is a definition of domestic partner, um, have priority. Assumed, if you stayed with her or him, he's probably the guy who's going to make decisions for you. Then adult sons or daughters, then your parent or the patient's parent, then an adult sibling, and then a close friend or relative not listed on that list. And if someone has been living with someone, is a close friend, has known them for many years, has participated in church with them, has participated in clubs, has gone on trips, knows this patient, then that person can be elevated to surrogate if the others don't exist. And each institution generally has a process for validating that close friend. It was also a way, before we had um, gay marriage, to validate close friends who weren't domestic partners, but who actually were people who were cared about by the surrogate. But it's still on the list. It's still an important person. And we can use those people as surrogates. So that's the list. Sometimes there's conflict in a group. So if you've got more than one adult child, they may be conflicted. One may say yes, one may say no, one may say yes dialysis, one may say no dialysis. Now you need to mediate and motivate conversation. You can't just choose the person that you like because that you agree with them. That's not actually the way it's supposed to be. And ethics can be helpful in consultation in those cases. So surrogates may make any decision that the patient could have made, but for decisions to forego life-sustaining treatments, including resuscitation, the patient must meet certain specific clinical criteria. This was not in the original bill. This was the negotiated settlement, so don't blame me for these criteria. But 
It has to be A or B. A, the illness will likely result in death within six months, whether or not the treatment is provided, or the patient is permanently unconscious and the treatment would be an extraordinary burden to the patient. So who decides to interpret these very vague terms? The doctor, based on reasonable medical judgment. Not absolute judgment, not truth, because we only can make a prediction. We can predict that the death will likely result within six months, but on the day after the sixth month is ended, we don't shoot the patient if he's not dead. But we can say this is a very serious disease and is likely to result in death. That's a medical judgment with a reasonable degree of medical certainty. Don't become a Philadelphia lawyer. Just be a doctor. It's a reasonable degree of medical certainty. And is it an extraordinary burden to the patient? Well, you've had other patients who you've given those treatments. Frequently, the kinds of things we're talking about are burdensome. Are they extraordinary burdens? That's based in your experience and the surrogate's assessment of the burden. So it's important to interpret this language. The legislators actually thought doctors would. I've got to tell you that. They actually thought doctors would make these interpretations. So they made them both vague, but quite serious. So doctors could be doctors. Now there's an or. You get an A or a B. B is the condition is irreversible or inc incurable. Well, most of the stuff that we get in our elderly patients is going to be incurable. It's going to be treatable, but it's going to be incurable, but it might be reversible. And treatment would be considered inhumane or extraordinarily burdensome. Again, that language of extraordinarily burdensome or inhumane. Inhumane frequently comes into this language, meaning that it's so abhorrent to you as a clinician because you don't want to be the agent of doing something that you think is going to be hurtful. That's where the inhumane language comes in. And we see a lot of inhumane treatment in medical centers, um, and particularly with those without surrogates, or with surrogates who are demanding treatments that clinicians don't want to give. For surrogate decisions to forego life-sustaining treatment, two attendings are required. So the attending of, of record needs to believe that that's important, and then a second attending <coughs> needs to be involved in that care. Mental illness or mental retardation needs to be taken into account in capacity judgments. So there is a law that gives us the basis for our ethical judgments about Mr. Rodriguez. And if we start with his wishes, if we understand where he began in this, we would strongly voice the view that Mr. Rodriguez doesn't want dialysis. Dialysis is probably life-saving. His surrogate, if Juan is his now surrogate, and let's assume he is, and that Juan is capacitated, wants his father to have dialysis. And if you cannot mediate that with his son, but if you believe it's your obligation to fulfill Mr. Rodriguez's wishes, as clearly voiced to you, then I think an ethics consult is required in order to sort this out. But in general, the ethicist will begin from the patient and would try to help the surrogate understand our obligations and his to listen to his father's wishes. Now, this is a very complicated case. Now, some people would say, well, let's do it once, get him back, and ask them again. A lot of people come up with that at the round table. Let's do it once, and then we'll see. We'll give them another shot at it. Um, some would believe that to be a reasonable approach. Mr. Rodriguez might not be happy about it. Um, I would not believe that to be a reasonable approach, but that has been the decision made in many institutions about patients like Mr. Rodriguez. And when he comes back and he says, 
I didn't want this. Um, and he gets beat up by his family. Then we get down a different path often. Um, but here was a clear case, I think. Let's take a different kind of case. Yes, Dr. Coleman. So for my liking, you passed over that too quickly. So I think, you know, when you look at capital punishment issues, you're dealing with a reversibility of a decision and an irreversibility of a decision. So I think unless you are certain without any benefit of doubt what he would want, one decision is reversible. You can, you can uh, do one dialysis treatment and ask him to be absolutely sure. And two days later, he can refuse dialysis, and a week later, he can you know, um, he can be, be dead. But if you're wrong, there's no reversibility. And so if you can't make that decision without any benefit of the doubt, you know, I, I think you have to make the different decision. And the second issue is, I, I, is really a question. What would you do to explore the relationship between him and his son before you allow his son to make the decision on his behalf? Uh, these are terrific comments. That's why they pay him the big bucks. So the first question comes down to Dr. Anderson and Dr. Sanchez. What have they done to explore with Mr. Rodriguez when he had capacity at the time of his prior illness and now during this last three months? How certain are they of his values and wishes? And it's true. If they really can't say that they have certainty, if they really didn't document in the chart their certainty, then Dr. Coleman's comment is really well taken. Um, that, I think, is a powerful question that we need to learn in our ethics consult from Dr. Anderson and Dr. Sanchez. Um, and we would know better after that exploration. The second question is, what about Juan and his father? Um, most of us have had fathers or have one. Um, actually, all of us have had fathers or had one. Um, all of those relationships are complex. Um, the question is, are they conflictual? Um, is there guilt between sons and fathers? Is there a desire? Um, well, we, we do need to explore with Juan what his relationship is. We do need to understand what his motivation is. Um, and we do need to understand his view of his father's values and where that's coming from. And in fact, that would be part of our exploration in the ethics consultation, um, probably first with the team and then with the team and the family. Um, and Juan might want to bring other members of the family um, to support his view that we should do the dialysis, uh, or at least do it once in order to make him capacitated. Complex, complex case. We didn't say that ethics is easy. We also didn't say that medicine is easy. And it's true that death is irreversible. Um, but patients really are allowed to make judgments that we find result in their deaths, uh, particularly in cases like this. So let's go to Gina Brown. She's an 89-year-old woman who's transferred to the hospital this morning from a nursing home because of vomiting and dehydration. Mrs. Brown has lived at the nursing home for eight years. She's been unable to converse in a coherent manner for many of those years. She has no known family or friends. She has no prior documents which document any of her wishes about future health care. Um, this is not an unusual patient in 2015 coming from the nursing home with no surrogate, no documents that give us any judgment about her values, no history except the history of having lived in the nursing home. On physical exam, there's a large mass palpable in her abdomen. So what should the doctors admitting Mrs. Brown do? Okay, we need a senior resident. Senior resident. It's not a senior resident in the room. We'll take a second year resident. We'll take a first year resident. <laughs> July, August, September. Okay. First year resident? First year resident? 
They're back there. They're not, they're not raising their hands. They're back there. First year resident. Okay. Mrs. Brown, nursing home. What are you going to do? If I have no idea of what her wishes are, then I would do the workup that we would do for anyone. So on physical exam, you find a mass. What kind of workup, very quickly, not very specifically, what kind of workup do you, what do you need to learn about her? CT abdomen. CT of the abdomen. You think that's a good idea? It's very expensive. Didn't they teach you about, you know, cost? <laughs> what do you think? CT of the abdomen, is it okay? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's okay. Um, so this is a diagnostic workup to figure out what Mrs. Brown needs, what Ms. Brown needs. That's pretty straightforward. As clinicians, we don't need permission to do standard medical diagnostic studies. If we're going to operate on Ms. Brown, we now have to figure out how we're going to make that judgment. But to do some x-rays, some laboratory tests, some standard treatments, standard treatments and standard medical evaluations, even though Mrs. Brown can't give us permission and we don't have a surrogate, we do have the authority to make some standard evaluations. So after fluid resuscitation, stabilization, and diagnostic evaluation, Mrs. B received surgery for a large malignant metastasizing tumor of the colon. It's all over her abdomen. On day two, postoperatively, Mrs. Brown has a cardiac arrest. She's resuscitated, transferred to the ICU, and placed on a ventilator. An acute deterioration after surgery. Three weeks later, Mrs. Brown remains ventilator dependent and has not regained consciousness. The attending physician and the neurology consultant both feel that Mrs. B will not recover any cognitive function. What should the doctors do? So Mrs. B is in the ICU. I found out where they're, you're hiding. Mrs. B is in the ICU. What should the doctors do? Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> what should the doctors do? They should try to find a surrogate. They should try to find a surrogate. What should the doctors do? Either. I'm not sure either. What should the doctors do? Um, I think just backtracking a little bit, I don't know if they necessarily should have done the surgery. Aha. That's still something to talk about. So the question is, he slipped that surgery in on you, right? Okay. Okay. What should the doctors do? That's probably why there's an ethics committee. So the unbefriended, the elderly, nursing home, unbefriended, or even community member without any relatives, without any friends, without any idea, has become a very serious problem for us as clinicians and for those of us um, who do ethics. So the New York State Family Health Care Decisions Act actually dealt a little with this. This was a very controversial area. Because when we have no idea about values of patients, death is irreversible. And we have no potential to know which direction they might have wished us to go. So the first thing to find out is, is this a patient alone? And do we really have no information? And we haven't got any information here in the chart in the big medical center. But what does the nursing home know about this lady? What does the nurse who's cared for her, what does the administrator know? 
We need to reach out into the community and learn. Sometimes we learn a lot. Sometimes we learn there's been a niece visiting her once a month who comes in from Philadelphia um, out of respect for her aunt, um, and maybe we can find that lady. Sometimes we find out that, oh yeah, she, she, before she lost the capacity, whenever anybody went off to the hospital, she would say, and we might learn something about her values. So we do have an obligation to do due diligence, to look for surrogates, and to learn from the nursing home what they might know about our patient. But there are three different kinds of care that the law suggests we think about. Routine medical treatments, major medical treatments, and withholding or withdrawing of life-sustaining treatments. So, you know the difference between major surgery and minor surgery. Minor surgery is a surgery on your patient. Major surgery is a surgery on you. Um, so, you know, ask Ben Carson about major surgery. Okay? Um, I knew that doctor when he was doctoring. Um, actually, he and I trained together. Um, and uh, he did some pretty big major surgeries. But he didn't think all of his surgeries were so major. You know? Even neurosurgeons think there's minor surgeries. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, if it's on you and it's neurosurgery, it's pretty major. But major medical treatments actually are defined in this law. Um, so routine medical treatments are diagnostic testing, medical treatments, not long-term respirator or feeding tubes. And attending can authorize those diagnostic tests, routine stuff you would do on any patient who came in with a diagnostic dilemma. Major medical treatments generally have more significant risks, usually bodily invasion, um, anesthesia. The attending with the team is supposed to make a recommendation and another physician designated by the hospital must concur. It's generally a medical director or someone of some stature in the structure of the institution that does a second look for this incapacitated patient who has no one as surrogate. But even this surgery would likely have been approved by that medical team because until they went in and found out how serious this was, they probably couldn't have been certain about the future of Mrs. B. And they would have wanted to debulk and to give this patient even a palliative operative care in order to be more comfortable, even if they were deciding that they weren't going to do any other interventions. So this surgery could have been justified based in this rubric. But it is important to raise the question, should we have done the initial surgery? It is a hard question um, to raise. But in Ms. Brown's uh, interests, it was decided. Now what about now? What would we recommend to patients who do have surrogates? What would we recommend to patients who are capacitated in Ms. Brown's situation? Now having debulked the tumor and had the unfortunate cardiac arrest, likely from a cardiac event of some kind, um, now what we, would we have recommended to surrogates in this case? Many clinicians in ICUs after three weeks, would have suggested withdrawing the respirator and allowing comfort care and allowing Ms. Brown to die. Others might want to transfer her to a hospice setting or start palliative interventions uh, with the idea that she would not be resuscitated if her heart stops. Um, but in order to withhold or withdraw life-sustaining treatment 
from a patient alone, either we need a court decision, and most times we don't, or an attending physician with concurrence of another physician designated by the hospital, that this life-sustaining treatment offers no medical benefit and would violate accepted medical standards. That's a very high standard. So for Ms. Brown, it's hard to say that her respirator would violate accepted medical standards. Many patients would be in her position. It's hard to say that um, the life-sustaining treatment of the respirator offers no medical benefit for Ms. Brown. And an ethics consultation here may be helpful, but if you wanted to push forward with withdrawing treatment for Ms. Brown before August of 2015, you would have had to go to court in most ethicists and lawyers' views. But something interesting happened this month, this past month. An amendment to the bill allows for transfer to hospice care without permission by any surrogate or any capacitated patient. That had never been thought about in the original bill, because if you think about 20 years ago when the writing occurred, hospice care was not as robust as it is now. It was not as accepted as it is now. And it was difficult to take a patient who we would have transferred into a hospice unit or to hospice care in a nursing home or palliative interventions. Now it is much easier. So as of August 13th of this year, when Governor Cuomo signed the bill, if there's an illness that will re likely result in death, like the surrogate criteria, or the patient is permanently unconscious and further treatment would be an extraordinary burden, or the condition is irreversible or incurable and further treatment would be considered inhumane or extraordinarily burdensome, and here again, this is a doctor's assessment, that recommendation can be made by the treatment team and a second physician, and an ethics committee must be convened to confirm that that, in fact, is a reasonable decision for Ms. Brown. So transfer into hospice, non-resuscitation, can be done for Ms. Brown um, now, as of August 2015. Now, I want to end by talking about moral distress. If you haven't had it, you probably don't know what it is, because you've had it. If you've been a clinician even as much as three months. It's the tension created when what you think should be done differs from what is being done. Our nursing colleagues deem this term and they feel it very acutely, and they feel it very commonly. But we've got some data in the pediatric world that pediatric clinicians who are intensivists, neonatologists, oncologists, and cardiologists feel it just as much. And I will bet that anyone who's been practicing for any length of time has felt moral distress. That is, that our values would not have resulted in what is actually going on. And dealing with moral distress is difficult. You know, you shouldn't go home and kick the cat. And you shouldn't go home and yell at your wife or husband. Or children. Sometimes we do. So you need to be part of a community, namely your community, the community of physicians, the community of clinicians, the community of your institution with your leaders, who are open to raising the concerns, to exploring individual value conflicts, and the impact of the law, society, and institutional factors on our practice. Sometimes what the law requires of us sucks. Sometimes we feel it's unethical. Sometimes we wish it were different. But yet, 
we have some obligations to fulfill those duties that we have to the law and other duties to our patients. So we have moral distress at times that we can't get over by merely behaving in the way we think is right. And in that case, we need each other. We need to understand that um, we need to respect one another's views and values. We need to be able to validate those feelings and then get on with our work. So I'm going to stop here. These three guys have been with me for a long time to remind me that I usually go over time. Um, but I will stay and I will take comments and questions both from this audience and from our outside audience if you would like, by whatever means, beam in the questions.